No planner, faculty, or staff of this educational program has any relevant financial relationships with ineligible companies. Well, we're talking about collective bargaining and physician unionization. And I wear my International Brotherhood of Laborers hat of 45 years ago, 50 years ago, local 125 out of Youngstown. And I'm grateful for them for their collective bargaining because they allowed me to get through school with no debt. And so I appreciate uh, what they did for me. Dr. Bussey is gonna talk about a physician unionization and why that's relevant now. We've, we've heard already that 70% of physicians now are employed. When you're employed, what, what do you do? What's, what's your job? You are to do what the boss tells you to do. And when patient care is the issue, are you going to do anything that is uh, against the patient interest? And the answer is, well, you have an obligation to your boss or you're going to be insubordinate. So you're in quite a compromise. Unionization of physicians is one way to handle it. And I'm going to talk about after you've unionized, what is the benefit of unionization? And it's actually only two things. One, collective bargaining, and two, concerted activity. So we're gonna start now. Well, I told you I'm from Youngstown, and I told you I was a Manila Maris fan. I also had one uh, idol as a youngster from Ohio, and that was Hopalong Cassidy. But as time goes by and you enter the adult world and especially one of labor, organized labor, organized physicians, you end up studying other individuals that have been successful in the same kind of endeavor. I have turned into a big fan of Jimmy Hoffa. Yes, he had problems and yes, he paid heavily for them. But one thing is undeniable about Hoffa. He formed the biggest union in America and he was incredibly successful in raising the standard of living for his members. It's undeniable. He was so popular, he could have got elected president from prison. But if we're gonna talk, well, let me make one more comment about Jimmy Hoffa. One of the favorite interviews I ever saw of Hoffa was they said, Jimmy, well, what exactly do you do? He said, I only do two things. I negotiate contracts and I enforce them. That to me is clarity of purpose and I appreciated it. And I've tried to bring some of that to the physicians union that that's what we do. Let's not get distracted. But we're from Northeast Ohio. <coughs> Can't talk about unions in Ohio without talking about the Steelworkers Union. IWI Abel was the third president of the United Steelworkers from 65 uh, to 77. And to his credit, by the end of the 70s, the United States Steelworker was the highest industrial paid worker in the world. Not only did he represent steel workers and the steel workers today uh, represent the aluminum workers, the atomic workers, the upholstery workers, brick and glass workers, pharmacists, school administrators. So they do more than uh, steel workers. <clears throat> We're gonna talk about his very famous ENA, a contract that he negotiated in 73, might be a term, the greatest contract ever, and also too successful a contract. Well, what is collective bargaining? 
the, the term was um, originated in, in Britain and the Samuel Gompers uh, developed it in the US, but it, it's collective bargaining really is defined as the continuous relationship, not sporadic, continuous relationship between an employer and a designated labor organization representative of a specific unit of employees for the purpose of negotiating written terms of employment. Why the continuous part? Continuous part is that it's there to enforce the terms of the contract. And in addition, they're in a well done contract, there's the ability of labor and management to come together anytime to see if they can solve common problems and increase productivity, which makes uh, everybody's uh, ability to bargain much easier. <coughs> is the collective bargaining relevant to physicians? Well, it's only relevant if you decide it's relevant. If you wanna go it alone, you think you can go it alone, that's great. Um, but the Union of American Physicians and Dentists uh, organized the LA County, all LA County of physicians, employed physicians, which is a thousand strong. And here was Dr. Weinman when he announced uh, the Union of American Physicians representing them. Collective bargaining, what's there's some misconceptions about collective bargaining. There, uh, uh, two sides are coming together. It's usually portrayed as uh, the labor saying, screw the boss and uh, management uh, believing uh, to keep the union in its place. Strikes, pickets get the headlines, but strikes really um, peaked right after World War II when everybody was trying to get a piece of the action. And the reality of it is only 2% of all AFL-CIO contracts have ended up in strikes. Well, how, how do you get to collective bargaining? How do you get to the place where you're in a position to collect a bargain? Well, first, uh, a bunch of, uh, let's say this case, employed doctors have to organize. They have to pick who they wanna be their representative. Everybody thinks the only people that can represent you is a union. That's not true. It can be anybody you pick as a representative. One of the most powerful representative bodies is the Teachers Association. They're not a union. I mean, I think they are a union now, but they started out as an association. And so anybody you pick can represent you. You have to go through the uh, petition process. You have to have a ballot. And then finally, um, your representative is certified as your sole representative. And then you begin contract bargaining. What are the laws that protect uh, this activity? Well, in the private industry, National Labor Relations Act of 1935 really establishes this. Um, and there's a couple sections that are critical to understanding labor, unions, and its rights. Section seven is a critical section. It states, all employees, have the right to self-organize, form, join, assist labor organizations to bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing. That's the law. Second thing, and to engage in other concerted activities, concerted activities for the purpose of collective bargaining of mutual aid or protection. What's that mean? That means you can get together with your colleagues legally and take some action to force the employer uh, to see maybe the, the wrongs of their ways or the rights of your ways. Now, a lot of strike activity that happened in the 30s are unlawful now, but still informational pickets are lawful. Dissemination of information is lawful. And so concerted activity is, is a critical right. So two things out of section seven, organize. Number two, concerted activity. What about section eight? Well, what's, what's the, what's the um, 
uh, limits of the demand. Let me see, I think I might have missed one here. I think I did miss one. Oops, I went the wrong way. Here we go. S section eight. We talked about section seven, section eight. It's an unfair labor practice for an employer to interfere with your organizing, number one. Number two, it's illegal to refuse to collectively bargain with a representative of the employees. Mandatory, you've organized, you've picked a representative, the employer must collectively bargain with that group. What about section nine? They're your exclusive representatives. This prohibits different factions from getting different representatives. Once you've elected your representative, you speak with one voice. What are the, what are the parameters that you're allowed to discuss? Should be exclusive representatives for the issue of pay, wages, hours, employment, and working conditions. That's private uh, employers. What about self? Uh, what about the government employees? They require special statutes uh, to allow uh, union representation or representation. In California, we have the Dills Act of '78 that allowed bargaining for state employees, including state-employed physicians, which there are quite a few. And uh, Meyer Milius Brown Act in '68 collective bargaining for municipal, county, district employees, covers all uh, government employees. Oops. What happened here? How did I mess this up? Okay. Okay, we're in good shape now. Well, after you've uh, picked your representative, um, what's the next thing? You have to have, you have to establish a bargaining unit. These are the people that you're going to represent in your negotiations. So this is a very important part of the negotiating process because employers will want to get a huge uh, designate a huge bargaining unit so that they you cannot get them to all agree to be unionized. And it's uh, better to have a small bargaining unit for the sake of establishing your rights to bargain, but then you've excluded people from your bargaining unit. So who makes up the bargaining unit? Really at the bottom, it talks about how you pick the bargaining unit. They have to share a community of interest, community of interest, similarity of jobs. Um, when we're doing physician uh, bargaining, it's physicians of all types um, in one institution or state doctors, no matter what they, where they work, prison, uh, uh, outpatient clinics, we get all the doctors. And the doctrine says they have to have a similarity of job functions, skills required, and a high amount of contact in between themselves. Then you have to have a bargaining team. The lead negotiator is critical. You can't have an inexperienced person doing uh, the lead on bargaining. The other side is going to come well, well done, and they they, they're the ones that have to say yes. Their, their, their reflex position is no. That's it. No, 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 and no. So you have to be able to counter that with some arguments that will carry the day. And bring in, in the bargaining team. You have to bring a team with different agendas. Uh, everybody, everybody represented the prison. 
when we do the state doctors, we bring the prison doctors, the community doctors, the hospital doctors, because they all know the inside uh, problems. Now, what are the limits of the demands that you're going to try to make uh, when you're bargaining for physicians? Well, you have to be prepared. Uh, you can't go in there and just look at each other and see who's going to blink first because that's you're not getting anywhere. You're just staring each other down. Um, so you have to do your research. You're allowed to ask for any information from the other side that you want because when you ask for wage demands, what's the first thing they're going to tell you? We can't afford it. Uh, how, do you, how are you going to argue with that if you are not entitled to their financials? They have to come in with their financials and tell you, show you exactly what it is that they, they're making. So you can ask for any bit of information. If you don't ask, you're not going to get it. Um, ultimately, the bargaining is influenced by the relative bargaining power. Simply, I mean, it's one rule that you have to know. If it costs more to disagree than to agree, the party will agree. For example, if the other side needs so much work to be done, you ask them for a certain amount of remuneration. If they don't get the work done, it's gonna cost them more to say no. So they're gonna say yes. We have to have this work done. Now, I've done a lot of contract work for individual physicians. And I always, uh, the first, I used to, you know, go through it, look at it. Now I do go about it a different way. I ask them first, have you signed this yet? And the answer usually is, yeah, I signed it. Well, then what are we, what are we talking about? You already signed your contract, individual. Uh, contracts. And the only thing they ever do, they go right to compensation and they look at it and okay. They don't know who they're working for, when, how frequently they're going to get paid, if there's any uh, compensation for uh, productivity. No, 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 no scrutiny to any restrictive covenants that Professor Hall was talking about earlier. Um, and so it's really uh, foolish, kind of foolish behavior uh, by physicians when they're uh, doing their own contracts. But when you're doing it as a, as a union, you're looking wages, benefits, working conditions, mandatory terms of a contract. So how, how do you fix, how do you fix wages in uh, physician contracts for a union? Well, the, you know, you have to come in with something. You just can't come in, you, you want this. Uh, you look, you go to surveys, you go to government reports. The government has a report on every industry, how much they make, specialists. Uh, and so it's hard to argue that that is the going rate. Now, if you want more than the going rate, what, do, what are you gonna say? How are you going to get more than the going rate? Well. If there's a, a particularly bad, rough, tough, unpleasant jobs, such as the prisons in California, we, you ask for their vacancy rate. What's your vacancy rate in the positions that you have to fill? And when you see a 70% vacancy rate, <clears throat> the argument is that we're not walking into a hospital with crisp white coats with embroidery on it, walking through the halls, you know, hi, Dr. Smith, hi, Dr. Jones, salutation, you know, how was your weekend? Oh, it was wonderful, thank you. No, you're walking into a prison where the prisoners are spitting on you. That's not the same job. That requires substantially more money to get somebody to do that. It just makes sense, but if you don't illuminate it, then you're not going to get it. One of the things that um, employed physicians, we're gonna to start to go through some of the things that we negotiate for employed physicians that 
you would not think the private uh, doctor or small uh, uh, em employed physician would not think or even possible to negotiate. But we've negotiated all of these issues. Pensions, it's fairly straightforward. The leaves, how many type of leaves do you think you could negotiate for? How about holidays, how many? How about allowances? What about merit salary, business expenses, merit awards, parking incentives, housing rentals, license renewal, continuing medical education? Every one of these is a bargaining point. Let's go through the leaves that we've negotiated uh, for physicians. Vacation leave. Some of these I didn't even know existed before I started to do this. Vacation leave, sick leave bereavement leave, military leave, jury duty, training leave, catastrophic leave, annual leave, disability leave, parental leave, adoption leave, catastrophic natural disaster leaves, personal leave, mentoring leave, work and family participation leave, organ and bone marrow donation leave, and a day off to go get your an annual physical. How about health and welfare benefits? You got health, dental, and vision benefits. We negotiate regularly. Long-term insurance industrial death and disability uh, leave benefits. How about working conditions? We have, we negotiate meal periods, rest periods, rest areas, call back assignments. And when it comes to uh, physicians and um, their superiors, which are many time non-physicians and uh, may ask you to do things that you know are not in the patient's best interest. We start to get into discipline and we negotiate adverse actions, progressive discipline, appraisals, performance appraisal, malpractice suits. Very interesting. When uh, I first started to do uh, contract negotiations for employed physicians, the um, the the uh, state says, yeah, well, we 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 will defend we will defend you. Well, uh, defending me and allowing me the choice whether I agree to your settlement or not is something that most uh, great carriers such as uh, Ms. Shear's uh, company will give you the option: you want to settle or do you want to go? take it to the distance. You work for most employers and will tell you, we decide what we're gonna do with your case. The other thing is that they never, I have never seen them yet cover uh, uh, fees to, to represent you in front of the medical board after they report you to the medical board for a, a malpractice action, which private carriers such as Mrs. Shears does cover, but uh, the number one reason, the number one reason physicians come to the union to be represented is this final issue. They have been pushed around and told about making professional judgments. This is the number one reason physicians want to organize and be represented. This is a, a, a contract. Uh, we, we will not sign any uh, physician uh, agreement that does not have this in it. The parties agree shall not practice, nor shall they be required to practice in any manner which places their professional license in jeopardy. We you say, well, what, what kind of behavior would that be? Sometimes the, the um, 
administrators want you to use a cheap medicine instead of a more current uh, medicine. Sometimes they have equal benefits, but one has much more adverse uh, uh, reactions. So their, their argument is, oh, it works the same. And not quite, uh, but that's the argument. Uh, then there's discharges. There's uh, you know all a manner of things where administrators who do not have a professional license do not have a professional obligation, will try to push physicians around. And let's face it, if you're employed and you don't have physician representation, you don't have uh, the benefit of, of a, a, a working a, a contract, what are your options? Let's, you know, let's be frank. If you're employed and your employer tells you to do something, what are you gonna do? You, you, you better have a ton of money already before you tell the guy to go pack it. Your other options are to do it and, and to uh, just, uh, you know, acquiesce. So this is, this is what the number one reason physicians organize to protect their uh, professional judgment, their integrity, and I think their pride. Thank you. Patty says that they are resending him the Zoom link. No, we already did that one time ago. So um, we don't have all to. All right, well then, uh, I'm going to have Patty ask him if he can uh, uh, come back and uh, give his talk after the, 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 let's see, after the medical student. Five minutes. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have about uh, five or six minutes before uh, we are scheduled uh, for uh, uh, Professor Markovic. Um, let's just sit tight for a few minutes. I think he's going to join us shortly if he hasn't already. Helping uh, We're trying to reconnect uh, the Zoom links with uh, uh, Professor Markovic, uh, who will speak next. And then uh, I don't know if uh, uh, Dr. Bussey can stay and uh, or return at 325 and give his talk then. Uh, that's what we're trying to organize. Uh, bear with us.
It's interference with uh, the internet. I think it's the Russians. <laughs>
Stuart, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay. So we, we have Stuart on by phone. Max, we have Stuart on by phone. <clears throat> That's what we can do right now, Max. Uh, okay. Uh, well, um, okay. Uh, how about Mylan? Because uh, he was supposed to be slotted for this, for this slot. Uh, we're working on Mylan. The question is, if, if Stuart goes now, I mean, the whole schedule gets moved around, but can can uh, Mylan stay to uh, stay on? 
And I'm uh, working on getting Mylan. Okay. All right, folks. Well, bear with us another minute. Crazy stuff. Medical students. You can do this 15 minutes if you want. Sorry. Hey, Stuart, can you just hang tight for uh, a few minutes, sure, please? No problem. No problem. No problem. Uh, medical students, can you, uh, uh, are you locked into your time slot or can you talk at a different time? I mean, we can. We're Assuming missing, everybody's here. We're missing one person. We won't do it earlier. Oh. We'll uh, do it later. Yeah, I think we're actually going to stay. All right. Well, hang on. We're still trying to get these people. Oh, right. Stuart, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, do you have slides? Yeah, I sent them over to Patty. Okay. Uh, all right, then we'll find them. And if worse comes to worse, and I truly apologize for this, um, if you give your talk uh, via your phone and just tell us when to go to the next slide, we'll, we'll yeah, do that. I can do that. Oh, you can do that. Oh, I that's can... even better. Okay. I mean, no, I can't do it, but I'll just tell you when the next slide is. I think it's pretty easy. I 20 slides. Uh, we're looking at something. Is that you? Legal Foundations for Physician Unionization? We see it. Yeah. That's are it. you doing that or are we doing that? Yeah, I think you're doing that. Oh. Uh, Is it on a default? I don't know. Is Rob back there? He's doing it. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> behind the, behind okay. the screen. So um, <laughs> we're jiggling the schedule around. Um, we're very sorry that uh, we can't see Dr. Bussey, but he is going to talk with us. I think we can all hear him. And we have his slides, and so uh, we will uh, let you share your slides with us and uh, go from there. All right, Dr. Bussey. Okay, well, thank you. I apologize for the uh, time snafu and the technology snafu. I guess it goes with the whole, you know, theme of uh, industrialization, <laughs> what's happened to uh, medicine. It used to be right on, uh, you know, simple issue with the professionalism. So I'll try to get this done in 20 minutes. The first slide shows uh, up in the upper left, a group of white coated doctors and then on the right side, uh, blue collar. Is that the first slide? You see that? You guys see that slide, first slide? Yes. Okay, good. Well, this is what we're gonna have to do. So uh, the question is, um, where is the profession going? Are we white coats with blue collars or is, uh, where's medical professionalism? The second slide, please. You see the second slide on what is professionalism? Yep. Yes? Yes? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. well, okay, good. All right. <laughs> well, this is different. Anyway, Alexander, uh, Abraham Flexner in the 1900s was a medical educator and he uh, he elucidated seven criteria for professionalism, which through the years, uh, some some aspects of medicine have most of them, some don't. 
intellectual activity, obviously, for individuals, by individuals, it can be a psychiatrist to a patient, a lawyer to a client, um, an electrician explaining something to a to a homeowner. That's a professional. You could argue it's a trade, but a profession also includes special knowledge and research to an acceptable end of helping people with training techniques, CME, CLEs, all that stuff that we do to keep our profession up to date. And uh, the other three criteria are a little interesting, moral moral community, uh, which you say medicine has been that way since Hippocrates, um, ethics of, of legal, legal ethics and altruism. Okay, so the second, the next slide, please, which is medical timelines. Do you see that? Yes? Yep. Okay, well, the timelines of medical professionalism start uh, way at the left side with craftsmen in them before uh, in 500, 1000 BC uh, in Greece and Rome, uh, giving potions and trying to help people with humors and uh, non scientific ways to help people. So it doesn't really, you know, meet all the criteria of professionalism. They didn't have any training. They didn't have any uh, organization. But when Hippocrates came in 460 BC, things changed. Hippocrates and the Hippocratic Oath describes a moral purpose. One of his quotes is, sometimes you give your service for nothing. And so we take the Hippocratic Oath as doctors to help people and become altruistic and moral, not just professional and sheer knowledge. In the dark ages, um, that didn't exist. So there were really no, nobody helping anyone in the world of medicine. It's sort of, that's why it's dark. In the Middle Ages, though, the uh, religious monks were er also herbalists. So they, they <coughs> practiced a profession where they um, had knowledge of herbs and they were altruistic. There was no organization, of course, but they were moral. In the Renaissance, you had... Um, sort of a bifurcation where the hospitals would take care of the poor that was organized into a hospital, but rich people uh, could get contracts. University doctors would take care of them. For, um, it wasn't until the 17 and 1800s, the American Medical Association, 1847, published its code of ethics. And then it was truly a profession. It continued on into the 1900s where uh, hospitals and the doctors told the administrators what they want. And it was truly a profession where it was self-regulating according to Flexner's uh, criteria. It was a golden age. I was, I'm so old, I, I don't wanna tell you how old I am, but I was actually, you know, enjoyed that until the seventies when things started changing with managed care and all the technology and all the third party payers that uh, pressured doctors to, you know, limit formularies of, of medicines and limit the amount of time people were in the hospitals and just basically telling, telling doctors what their protocols were. Now we have mostly employed physicians in the last several years who uh, really remind us of industrialization. Can you do the next slide, please? <clears throat> next slide shows the agriculture and first industrial revolution. I do that because I want to infuse what has happened in medicine and professionalism, and that is industry. And what is industry? It's just mass production and layers of uh, bureaucracy and people telling other people how to, uh, how to finish the product and manufacture it. In this case, it's medicine. But back in the 1760s, people would leave their farms and go to the factories in the cities and mass produce cotton, textiles, food. And that was really the uh, industrial revolution. People were coming over from Europe. Labor was cheap. The cotton mills, cotton gins, and the thresher machines were there to dictated how long you were in the factory. And child labor was done for 12 hours. There's a kid up there. And um, finally, there's so much resistance and exhaustion and abuse that uh, trade unions came upon Philadelphia and New York in the 1790s. Uh, the next slide, please. And that slide shows the second industrial revolution, which was in the late 1800s. And that was sort of the perfection of middle management. And Frederick Taylor, as you see on the right, was a blue-blooded Philadelphian. He went to Bethlehem Steel one summer and watched all the workers on the floor uh, create products 
and he thought to himself, well, I don't have to get my hands dirty, but I can sort of dissect and describe what the task is, building a car or making uh, iron into steel, and I can get paid for it. And he detailed the instructions and uh, then, you know, produced protocols for the workers. That's the middle manager. And that changed America in the late eight, nine, uh, 1800s. And he went on to work for the Ford Motor Company as the middle manager. So the next slide, please. The title of this paper was uh, Legal Foundations of, uh, of Physician Unionization. So the first, <clears throat> this is about labor. So the AFL, you might know, the American Federation of Labor was a uh, craftsman in the beginning in the late 1800s. As your plumbers, carpenters, musicians, shoemakers were in a federation of 100 craft unions, and that was what labor was in the United States. However, as the Industrial Revolution in the early 1900s produced cars and steel, uh, there was a competing organization called the Congress or Committee of Industrial Organization. That said that industry was labor, not craftsmen were labor. So they had sort of disagreements until 1955 after the Taft-Hartley Act, which was anti-labor. They merged into the AFL-CIO. Um, the Sherman Antitrust Act was uh, started by uh, John Sherman of Ohio, and he. this was during the age of 1890 when... Uh, People were, you know, the wages in America were great with um, all well, the assembly lines. People would come over from Europe <clears throat> and uh, Rockefeller would do mergers, acquisitions and monopolies. So the United States did not like that Department of Justice or FTC. It was back then produced Section one of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is to prohibit anti-competitive practice. And there was no price fixing. That was a big deal. No price fixing. Exclude. Um, and no exclusive, uh, uh, did, they couldn't exclude competition or limit output like uh, Saudi Arabia does with the oil right now. You couldn't manipulate how much you put out. That would be an anti-competitive practice in a cartel. Section two prohibited monopolies and mergers. So that lasted, that's lasted until the present time. We use the Sherman Antitrust Act to go after monopolies. We have Facebook and Amazon being threatened every few years with monopolistic practice. The Clayton Act of 1914, the major part of this act is that they stated that labor was not part of the Sherman Act. Labor was not an economic commodity, so it could merge, it could acquire, and it didn't. Uh, wasn't constrained by the Sherman Act. It wasn't a monopoly. It wasn't anti-competitive. That was a big deal because labor needed to increase. And so the, the United States government favored labor. It, upholded, it upheld peaceful strikes, picketing, boycotting, and uh, it was a big deal for labor unions. The, in 1912, we had the Department of Labor sort of broker all these abuses of, um, of the industries. If you ever read the, the Jungle by Upton Sinclair, you know the horrible conditions of unsafe conditions in the meatpacking industry and the sweatshops. Department of Labor lasted uh, to this day, of course, uh, brokering um, labor disputes. But what really is the most important of this page is the Wagner Labor Relations Act, 1935. It was created during the Depression when there were violent strikes uh, between employers and employees and the police, and it was done to protect employee rights and to encourage collective bargaining and to stop bad management practice, such as spying on employees, uh, questioning them, blacklisting them, and firing them. It was a big deal. There are two parts that you should know. Uh, I don't know if you're all law students or med students there, but Section 7, of course, of the NRA is about protected activities. That means you have the right to form unions, join unions, organize unions, strike, picket, and slow down work. Section eight talked about the unfair labor practices of the employer, which is anything that interfered with what I just said, any protected activity. You cannot, you cannot interfere with organizing in an unfair way or a picket in an unfair way. So it was a big deal. Um, it it pro prohibited discrimination and uh, refusal to bargain in good faith. And 
that refusal to bargain in good faith is met is uh, are many of the reasons why we have uh, strikes in the United States. They use Section 8 of the uh, Wagner Act to justify this. In 1947, the Taft-Hartley Act was a reaction. The war had ended. The Depression had ended. Uh, people were, industry was going full blast. Um, employers were uh, rebelling and the conservative part of the government uh, went against unions. So they, uh, it was sort of a retrenchment. Uh, they narrowed the definition of ULPs. They prohibited uh, um, union activity uh, in certain picketing instances, and they did not allow a closed or agent, uh, closed shop. Closed shop is when um, members are, uh, after they do a collective bargaining agreement, are, are forced to join the union as a condition of employment. You must be in the union to enjoy the uh, agreement that you just bargained for. Um, so that's called the union security agreement. It still exists in certain instances. An agency shop, they also, but they allowed an agency shop where you didn't have to join the union, but you had to pay a fair share. You didn't have to pay full dues, but you had to pay your fair share in an agency shop. So um, the other part of it down on the bottom of the page is the right to work laws. It started in Texas in 1940. Now 27 of the 50 states state that you don't have to join a union at all. If you are in a union environment, you don't have to join the union. You don't have to pay an agency fee. You don't have to do anything. You can enjoy the contract and you don't have to pay a dime. And that's in that's um, in 27 states. That is the law. And we had a recent uh, public uh, union law called the Janus Act. I didn't put it in, but that's three years old. And that means any government unions, you don't have to join them either. Now, our union has many government jobs and we have free riders. And by free riders, I mean people who enjoy the contract without paying any money at all. Uh, so that's the sort of the milestones I have. Then the next page, please. The next page is in the industrialization of healthcare. And of course, with all the <clears throat> demand in the late 1900s and since the ACA and the increasing aged population, the superior, you know, software that can transmit medical records from one doctor to another, you have a lot of people going to have uh, medical care and it's become an industry where you don't have, it's very difficult to run a business with all the demands of the patients. So now you have large medical corporations, Humana, Sutter, Kaiser, are managing this care and employing the doctors. When you have the Taylorism, which I say was middle management, and you have all the student debt. I don't know if you have med students there, but the average debt's about $300,000 when you graduate medical school. You're just happy to take the job. You don't, you know, people don't know what they're signing. And they sign contracts and um, our union has, been very well aware of these contracts, sometimes contracts of adhesion. We have third party rules from insurers and government regulations. We have competing professions like nurse practitioners and nurse and physician's assistant and that weaken the professional identity. Can you turn to the next page, please? Okay, next page is a fun slide. <laughs> it's really very good because from 1970 to, 19, to 2009, you had a 3,300% increase of um, that top graph that you see uh, shows an increase of administrators of 3,300%, while the bottom darker line is how many providers were increased, which is 150%. So there's a wild number of administrators jumping on the healthcare wagon. Turn to the next slide, please. And there's the healthcare wagon, $3.3 trillion, 19% of our gross national product in healthcare. And much of that is wasted, administrative, drug fees, pharmaceutical overcharges, and the horses, as you might guess, are the doctors and the providers who pull this wagon and are burned out. So what is all? what am I saying all this for? The next page means as the doctors become employed, they have many masters. They have patients they must listen to, hospitals and insurers, groups and attorneys. And number one is their employer who pays their check. They must listen to the protocols if they want to keep their job. 
um, and it, they have uh, like a, a triangle, right? It's not a triangle, it's a rectangle there, but the employer patient patient listens to the employer for what he's entitled to or he or she is entitled to, tries to talk to the provider. The provider has to talk to the employer. It's not the doctor patient relationship anymore. It is becoming an industry. So next slide, please. In the next, in since 1900, we had Germany and the United Kingdom form unions for physicians. Our union is now 50 years old next month, the Union of American Physicians and Dentists in California. And this occurred when the third party payers and managed care came in in the 60s. There's only two or three doctor unions left now, Doctors Council and ourselves. As the, um, now, why is why are we special? Because the AMA, the CMA, all the other groups cannot collectively bargain under the Wagner and National Labor Relations Act. They're not legally able. The AMA tried to do that in 2000. They did an experiment, but they did not know how to do it. This is a very tricky uh, way. You have to follow the rules of, of collective bargaining, and um, um, you have to. Yeah, you have you have to be skilled at it. So we, that's what we do for our our, our patient uh, our members who are doctors. And of course, like nurses and other successful healthcare unions, or uh, get more money by being in unions. Many studies show three to five percent more in salaries and benefits. Next slide, please. So it's easy to say this sounds great, but hurting cats is easier than organizing doctors. I thought I found this slide was amusing, but it's true. I've been president for 15 years, and it's easy to get a doctor on the line complaining, but it's, there's a lot of fear factor in there. If they join a union, they're going to get retaliated on. They are protected from retaliation, but it's difficult. Can you do the next slide, please? The next slide shows who's eligible, okay? That if, if you're an intern or resident on the upper left, you can go straight to the union because you are a worker, an employee, the 1999 Boston City Hospital case adjudicated that rent, interns and residents were not students, they were employees and could be unionized. If you're a salaried employee, as long as you're not a manager, you can go and become a union person. If you are a manager or supervisor, you're not eligible under the National Labor Relations Act. So that's all there. The next slide, please. Okay, so I know Dr. Batanti, I didn't, I'm sorry about this, but I didn't hear what he said, but I assume that he, he went over collective bargaining. Uh, just as a real quickie, on the left side, you want to go back and forth with your opening proposals and uh, get information and come to a tentative and final agreement. On the right side, though, Dr. Batanti hopefully talked about uh, the employer saying no getting a last best and final officer office offer and then impassing and imposing a contract. We don't want that. We don't usually get to that point, but if it happens, you can go to mediation and sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Next slide, please. And then this, this slide shows all the contract articles that we uh, usually go over in our physician contracts. We have uh, stewards and recognitions, hours of work, salary, safety issues. I put in bold those five things, professional judgment that you're, uh, we guarantee that we don't have to be forced to do any sort of treatment um, that the employer wants if it, if it impacts or endangers our license. And that's a very big issue. We've used professional judgment over the years to say no to employer practices that we don't agree with as professionals. Physicians' rights refer to all the other clauses of working hours and safety issues, um, contracting out telehealth. Uh, employer rights are the rights, you know, in stated in the contract to operationally do what they want uh, as an operator, and uh, that that's that's a big um, that's a big statement. We we sometimes come to issue with what what is the correct way to run a business, but they have the right to run their business as long as it's safe and good for the patient. Next page, please. We have just cause and uh, grievances up there. Grievances are contract violations, and the union has a duty to fairly represent a member who feels like somebody has violated their contract rights and told them that they can't have a vacation or they have to work overtime or they have to work certain places beyond their scope and they want them to do things they're not trained to do. So we have the 
duty to fairly represent him. Step one grievance, step two, step three. It's usually a time limit of 30 days per step. Um, if it's not, if the grievance is denied, we can arbitrate it if we if we have if we think it's a winner. Uh, we will arbitrate or has any decent chance of victory. We will go we will go for it and pay for it. But if it is a bad case and we don't have any chance, we own the arbitration and the member can pay for it. He or she can pay for it. Uh, just cause is when you are disciplined or and or fired. And the just cause is very important point of the union. Uh, you know, capricious firing, we don't need it. So you need a notice of a reasonable rule. It needs to be fairly investigated with proof. You've got to be treated equally with other people who have been accused of this and the crime must fit, fit the punishment. If you were, you know, we had people, you know, fired for telling off color jokes. Sometimes it's, you know, appropriate. Often it isn't. So we have progressive discipline for those cases. If you've never had a disciplinary problem, we have progressive discipline in our contracts. Last thing I want to mention here is uh, Weingarten rights. In the 70s, a woman worked at Weingarten Department Store in New Jersey. Um, she was a union member brought into an office for some discrepancies on her invoice um, and admitted something without a representative there and incriminated herself, the Fifth Amendment. So it went to the Supreme Court, and she was found to be right that she needed a rep to witness this conversation. So all our union members have the right to have a representative in the room with them when they are grilled and they have a reasonable perception of discipline. If someone says, come in, um, Dr. Bussey, I want to talk to you for something, it's no big deal. If you think it's a big deal, then you get a rep. You need somebody to witness it. So those are some of the rights. Um, the next slide, please. I told you about the unfair labor practices. Usually for contracts, it's failure to negotiate in good faith. In that case, if you're out of contract and you have no strike, if there's no no strike clause and your contract is expired, you have the right to pick it. You have the right to strike. Practically speaking, you have to give the employer or the hospital notice at least 10 days so they can get other people to cover for you, other out-of-state doctors or nurses. And that's fair. And we don't, uh, we don't restrict emergency services. We don't harm the public. Next slide, please. And we've had three strikes in 50 years. The first strike was in 1975 when the malpractice premiums went sky high. Jerry Brown did that. The lawyers lobby tried to do it, but the anesthesiologists, 2,000 doctors in California, picketed and slowed their paperwork down. And in one month, uh, Jerry Brown withdrew the micro. Next slide, please, is the doctor strike we had in 2015, University of California. Ten student health centers were did not negotiate in good faith over a year and a half, and we um, we picketed on that, and we had a one-day and a four-day strike. It, uh, you see this lady here. This is one of our stewards, but the old version in the 1800s of uh, strikers having violence, um, this is the opposite. It's ironical. She's helping someone, not breaking their kneecap. She's helping someone with a broken knee, so I thought that was kind of ironical. So we help people. Next page, you see that strike in UCLA. Um we we want it to end, but when the employer push is not fairly negotiating, this is what we resort to. This is three strikes in 50 years. Last slide, please. Last slide. Also, we help other people in labor. This is me up in a nursing. Uh, yours truly up in Seattle helping a nurse's uh, picketing. Sorry, uh, this is it. So I'm done with the uh, presentation. I apologize for this uh, technological snafu, but I hope everyone heard this. But yes. that's the legal foundations. Any yes, thank you very you? much. Sorry. Yes, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, we can have a applause. Uh, yeah, we apologize for the snafu as well, but you came across fine and your slides were great. Um, uh, we have a few minutes for questions, comments. Anybody remote? I, I mean, you know, the the sort of obvious question is. 
Um, is there, you know, how do you respond to the, you know, concern that, you know, unions are associated with, you know, workers as opposed to professionals, um, uh, you know, it, uh, you know, how, how does it, um, uh, uh, is there, is there a problem with it, in, you know, sort of undercutting the, the professional nature of the practice of, of medicine by physicians? Yeah, well, that's the, it's, it, you're right. That's the question. When people call up, they call they're tearing their hair out because they've been told what to do. They're exhausted with work. And that's why I put these slides in the beginning of the industrial revolution, that little kid who had worked 10 hours a day, child labor, people come in or are abused and told one thing on their contract that they're going to work eight hours here, but then they're surprised later and a bait and switch occurs when they are told, no, you're going to do more than that. You're going to expand your scope of practice and see psychiatric patients while I'm on internal medicine. So people get pushed and they feel like workers. So the people who call us, they, you know, they're well-meaning people. I mean, I, <laughs> been a doctor 35 years I'm still in private practice but you know there's no prof you don't have self-regulation anymore you're told to do by someone who hasn't been in a room with a patient and uh you do feel constructively i don't know the legal word like like a worker so i mean i always thought that we had a white coat but a blue collar i always wanted to sort of have that as our new logo i think you can be both you can be a profession you can be a plumber which is kind of a profession and you help people and you do that. You have a blue collar. So I don't see much difference anymore. I think you're being used to the for profit by, by organizations that care about the bottom line and you're a pawn and, and certain people recognize it and they call me up and try to organize and certain people don't. Uh, eventually, I, I just don't know where the uh, homeostasis will be in 10 or 20 years, whether it'll be fair for doctors or there will be, working themselves to death. Don't know that, but I do feel myself that we are working for somebody else. Uh, Dr. Curris. Hi, Stu. Uh, Mike Curris here. Uh, thanks for that great talk. Uh, just a couple of quick questions for you. Um, what is your experience in organizing outside of the municipal and state workers, like a large integrated health systems or academic medical centers? So what's been the experience in California and elsewhere? And, oh, and where else have you organized? Yeah, yeah, Mike. So we're just, as you know, we're going up to Washington about six years ago. And we uh, have, um, I'll just tell you, we're in Multicare, which is a conglomerate up there. They, you know, quote, nonprofit, but they are, you know, they're acting like a cartel. They dominating the market. They have urgent cares all over the place. And we have urgent care doctors. Our experience is um, they're more afraid to do it than government people are. Um, as you know, there's 850,000 doctors. There's only two or three percent are unionized. Most of them government, but they, we're getting more and more phone calls from private doctors who feel like there's nowhere else to turn. We're going up to Spokane next week. We're going. We are in New, New Mexico now, and it's the same principle. You just join with your colleagues, and you uh, and you just organize a bargaining unit. Now, private doctors, you're, you're a private doctor. They don't have any antitrust protection. They never, <laughs> probably never will. And, you know, they, they're, they're a different animal. Um, they're a different animal. They are not used to working uh, together and they're, they're not allowed to collectively bargain. So I say that the, the me, you know, the, the intermediary is the conglomerate, the physicians who work for these, you know, Humana's and Aurora Health Systems out there in the Midwest. Uh, I don't know what's in Cleveland. What's in Cleveland? What's the biggest one in Cleveland? Is Kaiser in Cleveland? I think they are. Some, anyway, so they're the ones that we're going after now, and uh, they're a little bit harder because they're more afraid. There's less protection for them. And the employer is more emboldened. They're not, they don't have due process in the back of their head. They're just, you know, they're, they're wheelers and dealers and they're, they're not afraid of the law. That's the other thing. They'll fire somebody and they'll accept a lawsuit settlement and just to teach people a lesson. So they're a lot more vicious than the governments are. I don't know if that answered your question. It did. Uh, what would you tell some of the med students here who are gathered uh, in terms of um, oh, they yeah. finally finally hit the street and have to get a job and pay those 
those loans. I, I, I say, I say, learn contract law backwards and forth. Is it med students or law students that I'm addressing? Yeah, med students. Oh, it is med students. Oh, okay, I thought it was law. <laughs> okay, so all you med students, you know, I'm from Loyola. I went to Loyola. I gave a talk at Loyola a little while ago. And law schools, I don't know, or med schools are kind of problem. Part of the problem, they're very innocent. You know, they they teach you the Krebs cycle and all this stuff that I never used. But they also get you, you know, three hundred thousand in debt, and they make you grab the first job you can get. Get the con- get some contract law under your belt so you can negotiate your contract or get your friend or get a lawyer or Mike Curtis or somebody that knows contracts and, and show that person what this company is offering you and negotiate because they need you more than you need them. They need you more than you need them. And you should counter what you get. You should negotiate that contract. You should learn contract law, read a book on it, take a course on it, or get a friend who knows the law and fight for your contract. Because if you sign something, (laughs) they're going to take advantage of you. Sorry to be that way, but, um, you know, you, you know, or you may think I'm a little too cynical, but many people in Kaiser are, are, are just so exhausted with these uh, emails they have to do every night. They work till eight o'clock doing emails at night after, you know, 10 hours of work, they go home and talk to their patients. It, they don't have to do that because they don't have to agree to it on the cost. That's Thank you. Long... Um, so I have applications to law school for any of the medical students who would like to. <laughs> Uh, learn contract law. Um, uh, yeah. Let's right. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Fred, you have a question or comment? Um, actually, two questions to to either one of the of the two speakers, and and I thank them both for for educating me. Um, the first is a question about on the base of one of the hallmarks of, of the 20th century medicine has been the rise of, of specialties and specialty boards and, and subspecialties. And um, your, your opinions on whether within this environment, uh, there's been any impact on, on a phrase that you've all taught me and that is a substantial mutuality of interest. Uh, in other words, has the rise of subspecialty medicine impacted on a, a shared sense of, of community and mutual interest? And the second question is, is bargaining for professional judgment issues different for bargaining for other types of things? No, let me answer the second question. No, it's no different. We have professional judgment clauses in every contract we do. And uh, they're expecting it now. Uh, We have uh, in the prison system in California um, a drug program. You know what Suboxone is, right? Uh, Bupropius, you know, that you give to addicts um, to detoxify them. Well, this prison system, I'll just tell you, in California, they, they made it a ginormous jump that we that our primary care doctors should do there's a hundred thousand inmates they said let's go for it let's let's detoxify these prisoners these people are overwhelmed and they felt that it was not in their professional judgment and and against their license to just write prescriptions in the type of program that the prison system created which was harebrained stupid and dangerous without any cognitive backup or anything. You say, oh, write the prescriptions, they need it. So we had, we've had we had a year and a half fighting over a professional judgment issue that is a big issue. And, and it goes for anything that the employer could theoretically tell you to do uh, or kick a person out from uh, normal delivery and, you know, 12, drive-by delivery or, or a C-section or something that doesn't make any sense to you. It's really important to do that. That's like one of the number, it's one of the three things that's most important to preserve your autonomy, your thoughtfulness, your voice, and and instead of being a pawn, you know? And so it's easy to do that in a contract and then the fighting begins, but you have to have that. I don't know what the first, Bob, you wanna do the first question, which is subspecialties? 
Yeah, I, I think that the question was, can we represent specialists, subspecialists, and uh, general practitioners all in one contract? And the answer is yes, we do it all the time, uh, recognizing that each, each one of those groups maybe has a, a higher market value and we'll negotiate separately for different classifications of physicians. So yes, we can, we can do that and do do that. Um, we have a question from Professor Silvers. Um, Professor, just a second, Professor Markovic, uh, if you can hear us, yes, nod, okay. Um, are, are you okay if we come to you in just a minute or, or just a, a minute or so? Are you still- so Take your time. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, Professor Silvers. Uh, a quick question, you might have touched on it before, but um, non-competes, uh, do you guys, are you negotiating on non-competes now? Because it seems to me that's one of the major issues in terms of the economics of the business that uh, damages the ability of physicians to have any autonomy. And yeah, yeah. What, up in Seattle, the, when our Indigo doctors are get burned out and they want to leave Indigo Urgent Care, you know, we have 130 of them. They had a 30-mile non-compete, and so we knocked it down to five. In fact, they said you can't – and the, the satellite clinics extended 30 to 50 miles outside of the main hub of Seattle. And so we – we took, you know, we mitigated it by saying um, five miles from your clinic itself. But the way it was previously written, they had to almost go to Idaho to do it. So, yes, we negotiate non-competes, sort of mitigated. Most of them, a lot of them you can fight and you're illegal or, you know, you'll win the fight if you want to do it. But but we sort of mitigated in the contract, you know, not destroy it, but make it more reasonable instead of going to you know, miles away from the furthest satellite clinic, you don't, you can just put up your own shop or get another job from, from your local clinic. So that's what we've done so far as an example. What do you think? Do you think they're illegal or do you think the individual doctor should fight it? I don't know what it is in Ohio, California. You put up a fight and you usually win it. Not a legal is that the case in Ohio? Seems like restraint of trade to me that, that there should be. Oh, some... yeah. The 13th Amendment, right to travel and do work. It, 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 you, got, you got to put some money up, though, and you got to fight an organization that, that wants to make an example of you. They don't want you escaping and all your friends say, hey, he, you know, he opened up a practice. Let me do it. So it's a big deal for the employer to win that case. Other questions or comments? Uh, yes. Can we have a microphone? Uh, over uh, up to one of our. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I learned a lot. So this question might come off as a little naive, but forgive me because I'm a medical student, not a law student. So I don't really understand all the, you know, technicalities of things. But I was wondering about, I guess, your opinion on the collective power of physicians to um, unionize and ask for things beyond um, what, you know, like what's in their professional contracts, like advocating for patients in that way, or like maybe yeah. even, um, I guess, uh, bargaining against like insurance companies and how they um, dictate prices for medications and treatments and stuff like that, if that is something that you think is possible or would be useful? Just what's your opinion on that? I think, you know, with, with, with the vaccination issues here, with, with all the things about the abortion issues and, and micro, like I told you, we had the strike in 1975. We reversed it. And politics, here's what I have to say to you. This is a political profession. 19% of the money in this country goes to medicine and providers. If that's not the definition of politics, I don't know what is. A lot of people are employed in healthcare and doctors are the tip of the spear. They should have a voice in any issue, including insurance reform, smoking, gun control, vaccinations, abortion. And we don't have a big enough voice because other people grab the microphone who don't know what they're talking about and dominate it in legislature. We have several of our doctors in the legislatures in California. And I suggest if you want change, to run for an office <laughs> because 
as a doctor, you'd be loved by people. Uh, this place has too many lawyers in legislatures. And, you know, the doctors have been successful out here in California, and they could be in, I don't know how many, I think there's 30 doctors in the United States uh, Congress total. And um, usually pretty well received. So I guess the answer to your question is collective power through politics, through initiatives, you know, petitions, anything you go. Like there is power in collective action. Yes. And even in med schools. So, I mean, let me ask you this. Is there something in the med school that you guys think is just totally wrong? Or would you, you don't have to answer this. But, but you know, know, if there was, <laughs> huh? Am I uh, insulting the, the, no, the I people said, in the... I said, can we turn off the a recording? That was a joke, though. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. That's heresy, what I'm saying. But, you know, med school... It's unwittingly part of this problem when they indebt people $300,000. It sort of sends a cascade effect, like like I said in the industrial thing, that it's people who work hard, exhausted, burned out, and broke. And when you stay do tuned. that, you don't want to... Huh? Am, I, am I overdoing this here now? No, just stay tuned, because the, our, our students uh, will shortly be addressing uh, precisely that issue. Um, but, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, without, I think uh, we need to move on. Uh, Professor Markovic, are you still with us? You were. Uh, can we show him again, please? I am here. Great. Uh, so sorry for the uh, for the technical problem, but so glad that you could stay with us, uh, stay and, and present to us. So uh, uh, please uh, proceed. Is there anything we need to do at our end to facilitate your talk? Uh, no, not at all. Just uh, I want to apologize again for my uh, untimely arrival. Uh, it's been that kind of week. Uh, I uh, unfortunately was planning to attend in person to, to see you all, and uh, but I received uh, the, the bad news that after two years I had uh, uh, caught COVID, and uh, it uh, hasn't been as mild as I hoped. Uh, feeling feeling fine, uh, but please bear with me if I have um, the uh, the occasional uh, coughing uh, fit here while I'm uh, safe at home. Um, so uh, just a little bit of ba background about me. Uh, my name is Milan Markovich. I'm a professor of law at Texas A&M University School of Law, uh, which is actually located in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, not in College Station, uh, Texas, which is great for me because I'm more used to big cities. I'm originally from Toronto, uh, although I was educated entirely uh, in the United States. I also um, am the convener of the Law and Social Science Program at Texas A&M uh, University. Uh, so my topic today is going to be beyond morals of the uh, marketplace, uh, lawyers as uh, fiduciaries. Uh, so I'm a legal ethics scholar. I will not to be, be, pretend to be an expert on medical ethics, which are obviously very different than legal ethics. Uh, but I hope I can offer some lessons that we've learned as lawyers uh, and what it means to be clients fiduciaries. And hopefully this experience will be helpful to the medical profession uh, recognizing, of course, that there are specific, specific reasons that the profession has evolved the way that it has. So if you'll indulge me, I'll begin with a uh, personal uh, anecdote uh, to illustrate, I think, the importance of this debate about uh, fiduciary duties. So like many people, I assume, I put off dental care during the pandemic for fear of getting COVID. Uh, so in January, uh, when it seemed safe to kind of embark, I found a new dentist and I scheduled a, a basic checkup and cleaning. By the way, notice I'm focusing on dentists and not doctors. Uh, I figured that's a safer space. So in, uh, I ended up at the dentist for nearly two hours and uh, at the, my first visit. Only 20 minutes of that time was spent on this actual teeth cleaning. The dentist told me various things. I needed to have very uh, my old fillings replaced. I think a number of them. Uh, he claimed I had periodontal disease that we should treat with a series of uh, deep cleanings, which involved lasers. Uh, the dentist also told me that uh, I should meet with his sleep apnea specialist, although I have no problem sleeping and don't snore. Um, so I was a little bit perplexed by all this, um, but nevertheless, I went ahead with the deep cleaning. I, I care about my gums. Um, and this, this treatment consisted of a uh, two separate appointments with the dental hygienist. I was told that my insurance didn't cover uh, the procedure as detailed in my treatment plan. So I ended up with a bill of $1,600 uh, 
uh, roughly $800 per hour of hygienist time. Uh, the cost would have been even higher, but I declined to have the last quadrant done because I was a little bit mystified by, by the costs here. So I didn't think about this, uh, this, these trips to the dentist and hygienist again until I received a statement from my insurer, which is required in Texas, indicated that I had an agreement with the provider to charge $150 to, uh, for the basic cleaning. In other words, that's all they could charge me was $150 for the basic deep cleaning. So uh, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not that bad at math. Uh, $1,800 is a lot larger number than $150. So I confronted the uh, dentist with this information. Why am I being charged? Why was I charged $1,800? And we spent the next few weeks going back and forth over what had been disclosed to me and the reasonableness of the charge. My basic position was, was simple. I am not a dentist. I was relying on the dentist to present to me various treatment options, including options that would be covered by my insurance. Their basic, their basic view was, you agree to the treatment plan. You're an adult, heck, you're a lawyer. It's not our fault if the insurance doesn't cover the deep cleaning that you agreed to. Looking back on it now and connecting this episode with the theme of the conference, I think what our dispute was really about was competing conceptions about the relationship between dentist and patient. And if we want to extrapolate professionals generally and their clients and patients. <clears throat> my view was that the dentist should prioritize my autonomy and put my interests first. And part of that would be providing me with all the information I needed to make an informed decision his financial interests really should have played little role. His conception was much more in line with the view of for-profit businesses generally. We operate in a free market. Clients slash consumers slash patients can either take it or leave it. So I, I'm not saying that any route is necessarily right or wrong, but I will say this. Dental services, medical services, legal services, they can't be evaluated the way you can evaluate the food at a restaurant, for example, or the service at a restaurant. The ordinary patient doesn't know what services he needs or doesn't need, and if they have been provided competently after the fact. Um, in economic terms, we often call uh, these types of services, uh, services credence goods. And because legal services are so hard to evaluate, the legal profession has historically treated lawyers as fiduciaries to check the power that the profession has over their clients. But what does it mean for a lawyer to be a fiduciary? Well, I, I have to bring you back to a case coming out of uh, New York in 1928. Uh, it was decided by Benjamin Cardozo, who would eventually sit on the US Supreme Court. The decision had nothing to do with the regulation of lawyers. In fact, it involved a case uh, between business partners. One gentleman, his name was Salmon, received a 20 year lease on a property in Midtown Manhattan. To improve the property, he turned to another gentleman, Meinhard, for funds. Salmon managed the property day to day. Meinhard financed the project for 40% and eventually 50% of the profits. Prior to the conclusion of the lease, Salmon received the opportunity to redevelop the site as part of a much larger project. He did not inform Meinhard, even though they had flourished in their venture together. Cardozo ultimately held that Meinhard was entitled to 50% of Salmon's interest in the new venture. So Salmon versus Meinhard is one of the most famous cases in American jurisprudence. Cardozo's only comment on the case is something he wrote to another justice, Felix Frankfurter. Meinhard versus Simon is one of the cases in which some of my colleagues think that my poetry is better than my law. I think its, it's law is better than its poetry. So the key question in that case, and I think the key question when it comes to what does it mean to be a fiduciary, is why did Simon have, uh, Simon have to share the opportunity with Meinhardt? Why did he owe him anything at all? According to Cardozo, Simon had put himself in a position in which thought of self was to be renounced, however hard the abnegation. Many forms of conduct permissible in a workaday world for those acting at arm's length are forbidden in those bound by fiduciary ties. A trustee is held to something stricter than the morals of the marketplace. Not honesty alone, but the punctilio of an honor the most sensitive is the standard of behavior. 
As to this, there's developed a tradition that is unbending and inveterate. So setting aside the very beautiful prose there from Cardoso, the legal profession has largely internalized as a formal matter, this ethos of finest loyalty, honor the most sensitive, as opposed to the arm's length morals of the marketplace. And the reason for that is largely historical. It had no choice. Unlike the medical profession, the American legal profession has not been held in high regard for most of its history. In fact, most would say that it's still not held in high regard. Uh, nevertheless, there's been advancements. Pre-revolution, the American uh, legal profession was completely disorganized. Anyone could claim to be a lawyer and there was no formal means of becoming one. Uh, professional discipline was ad hoc and controlled by individual judges. Exploitation and fraud were common. People were reluctant to even use lawyers. Conditions approved after the revolution, but most lawyers still had formal, a little formal legal education. To become a lawyer, one only had to apprentice for a, a member of the profession. Many law, uh, lawyers didn't attend high school, let alone college or some kind of formal legal program. So by its own admission, the legal profession was envious of the medical profession and sought to enhance its prestige in various ways. So we basically copied what doctors were doing in many ways. We introduced licensing exams. We required attendance in law schools, uh, just like obviously attendance was required in medical schools. Uh, we also drove out many of the quote unquote less reputable law schools. Um, last but not least, the profession began to de develop ethical codes that sought to uh, counteract the perception of lawyers as self-interested uh, swindlers. Fast forward and one can now not become a lawyer without completing seven years of higher education and passing a bar exam as well as a separate ethics exam. And the concept of lawyers as fiduciary endures and is found in our ethics codes. So I'll just spend the rest of my time setting out some ways that uh, the ethics codes recognize lawyers as fiduciaries. Uh, first, think about fees. Lawyers can only charge reasonable fees. So it doesn't matter that a client is happy to pay. Um, what this means in practice is that a client could be very happy to pay for a very, very high rate, uh, but the lawyer could still be disciplined for an unreasonable fee. If, for example, that fee is out of balance compared to what other lawyers are charging in the jurisdiction. There have been cases where clients have obtained fantastic outcomes because of almost <coughs> uh, unprecedented work by their attorneys. This happened in the tobacco litigation, for example. And where attorneys were still held to have charged unreasonable fees because the, the fees were viewed as just so, uh, so large that they could possibly not, they could not possibly be reasonable. Conflicts of interest are also highly regulated by the profession because they're viewed as completely antithetical to the notion of lawyer, lawyer as fiduciary. So lawyers can take on representations that are adverse to their clients, even if they have nothing to do with the business that they uh, provide to their clients. So think about lawyer, lawyer Joe, if he represents Sally in negotiating an employment agreement for her, neither he nor anyone in his firm can take any representation against her, uh, even if the representation involves something like a family matter that has nothing to do with the employment uh, agreement. So what this means is lawyers are often forced to decline business that they would probably prefer to take, but they can't because of this notion that we have this loyalty uh, to our clients and we this duty of loyalty persists um, regardless of our financial interests. Even in terms of entering into a business deal with a client, a lawyer cannot enter into a business deal with a client unless essentially that um, <coughs> business deal is approved by a, another attorney, another separate attorney. And the terms have to be quote unquote objectively fair. So what we tell our students is never invest in your client's business, never lend your clients money. It is just simply not worth the risk and hassle. It's almost as though we expect lawyers to pretend that they're not business people in many of their interactions with their clients. So this persistence of this fiduciary duty ethos, which admittedly is often breached, but it has been useful in forestalling some of the changes that we have seen in other professions. So for example, the American legal profession has thus far resisted the corporate delivery of legal services. 
Non-lawyers cannot own or operate law firms with a few narrow exceptions in a few states, Arizona, Utah, um, thus far the main ones. The fear has been that non-lawyers do not understand the profession's ethics and the duties that they owe to their clients and would encroach on our independence and relationships with our clients. So many in my field, and I, I would say I'm very much a minority in this, many in my field kind of dismiss these concerns as rooted in economic self-protectionism. And there's probably an element of that. But I also think that there's inherent tension between maximizing profits, as corporations are legally bound to do. And I, I teach corporations as well as uh, legal ethics. And there's a tension between this corporate uh, profit maximization and safeguarding clients' interests. And indeed, putting the client's interests ahead of our own financial interests. So think about uh, a lucrative case, not, not frivolous by any means, not a complete loser, but a likely loser. A lawyer who is working for, let's say, a firm controlled by a private equity fund, is he going to drop that case, advise the client to drop that likely loser, even though it's lucrative for the firm, knowing that the private equity firm is looking for a certain kind of return? I'd like to think in our current state of affairs, uh, the lawyer has a great deal of autonomy to do so. So going forward, I think we're likely to see a lot of the changes in the legal profession that you've already seen in the medical profession. But regardless of the level of changes that occur, that occur regardless of the involvement of non-medical professionals and non-legal professionals in our various markets, I think we should always seek to operate beyond the morals of the marketplace to bring us back to Justice Cardozo's words. Because the services we provide, legal services, medical services, were never intended to be bargained for and traded in the traditional free market, nor can they really be valued in the traditional free market or evaluated in the traditional free market. And the role of regulators, in my view, it should be to ensure that professionals retain enough autonomy to be able to put their clients' and patients' needs first. Uh, and so they should ensure that that autonomy is protected on a going forward uh, basis. So thank you so much. I hope I've offered some uh, interesting lessons uh, from the legal profession and some explanation as to why it evolved the way it has. And I look forward to any questions or comments you may have. Thank you. Questions or comments? Uh, okay. Do you have one? So. Wait, wait, we got to get you the mic. Where do you think it would be more pure for a physician to be a fiduciary, as an employed physician or one in private practice? Uh, so, uh, employ. Could you uh, could you describe what you mean by employed physician? Um, work work for a hospital system. Okay. Oh, that's what that's what I thought. Okay. Um, and so I'm not going to get into the differences of the kinds of hospital systems or whatnot, not for profit, what have you. But I, I would actually probably say the private, uh, the private practice uh, model in, in, in many respects. Um, and uh, it, again, assuming it's a uh, particularly if there aren't many stakeholders beyond those who are immediately servicing patients, uh, I think it is uh, easier in those kind of smaller environments uh, to fulfill uh, fiduciary duties. I would also say that in a larger systems, uh, fiduciary duties have largely been supplanted by rules and regulations, which are not necessarily the same thing, right? I think sometimes we have uh, we have replaced broad-based duties and notions with very specific uh, and targeted regulations. And while they're undoubtedly well-intentioned because you want to address a wide variety of scenarios and perhaps ensure that, or, or try to ensure that folks are not using their discretion uh, in a negative manner. We're also, I think, undermining the, the core of the fiduciary duty standard, right? Which is a standard for a reason. Um, it's supposed to be flexible. It's supposed to be guided by the, the patient or client's uh, needs. So, to, a, so I think the private pra practitioner probably has a little bit more room, particularly if he's not part of a larger system. Let, let me make one comment, though, just to make a, a, a clarification. Um, lots of lawyers are employed by, you know, companies, uh, but but the, their client is their employer. It's not like they have a separate client 
the equivalent of the patient as in a conflict with that employer. So that kind of professional employment is, you know, is, is, is okay. It's because it's not conflicted. Oh, so. yes. Yeah. I, yeah. To be, so I study the legal market. Uh, the vast majority of lawyers are private practitioners. They, they service private clients, but something like I would say 15 to 20% of attorneys work uh, what we call in-house. They work in-house for, um, for corporations and exactly as noted, uh, they service the one corporate client and their duties are uh, to the corporate uh, client. And then that's where their fiduciary duties lie. And that's important because sometimes lawyers can get confused between their duties to the corporate client versus their duties to particular individuals within the organization. I just wanted to say it. We're, I'm pretty sure you look darn healthy and I hope you recover real quick. And I don't think Thank anyone you. could think you're sick. Uh, last point is, you know, I always, I'm a surgeon, so I'm always wondering, you know, as a fiduciary, of course, I do better financially if I do surgery on somebody, but uh, the, the, employee, the employed physician is going to be paid whether or not he or she does surgery. So I always wonder where, where that, the concept of fiduciary comes in and, and to what extent the self-interest of the physician doing a procedure versus not doing a procedure. You know, we always try and do the right thing for each patient but sometimes the perception can be different than the reality. No, that's an excellent uh, point. And uh, here's, here's what I try to tell my, my students about this. And it's the, same, it's the same thing, regardless of practice setting. You know, the question is just, um, you know, and obviously uh, practice settings uh, just vary greatly. I'm sure that there are some hospital systems that are um, far more deferential to physicians than others. Uh, just like there are some firms that are far more deferential to individual uh, attorneys than others. Uh, I think the only, I think that where fiduciary duty really comes into me is this. Um, it's a useful check against motivated reasoning, right? So it's one thing to say, oh, I always want to do uh, the best for my patients, right? Uh, just like lawyers will always say, I always want to provide zealous advocacy for my patients. Uh, for my uh, clients. But I think it's helpful to take a step back and say, okay, but am I potentially engaging in motivated reasoning here, right? And I'm saying that this surgery is in the best interest of my patient, but it is also in my financial interest. Is it possible that that's kind of affecting my assessment of this? Because if, if my financial interest is even clouding my judgment just a little bit, right, isn't that a problem? Right? Do I need to maybe take a step back and, and consider? Maybe I need to consult with someone you know, who I trust, maybe a, a fresh perspective. So th that's kind of where I think the fiduciary duty framework comes in. It's not so much the specific requirements as the idea of the undivided loyalty, right? just renouncing the sense of self. Right? And I think even th those of us who are incredibly moral, I think we can't help sometimes you know, have motivated reasoning. So I, I always tell my students, you know, whenever you feel like this is the absolute right thing to do, no question, just take a step back and say, okay, but is there some reason that you might be so inclined to think this way beyond, besides the love of your patient or client, right? And, and I, I, with all due respect, Dr. Kuras, I mean, your premise was if you did surgery or didn't do surgery, the financial effect on you would be the same. Um, and uh, I mean, so no, no Christmas bonuses. Think you know, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. No profit, you know, no profit sharing, no incentives. I mean, I mean, uh, and it, even you know, on a non-financial basis, you know, if you're not uh, doing a lot of lucrative things for your employer, um, you know, bad things can happen to you, and and they may not be much. You you may not understand it as connected or not. So, um, uh, you know, I think it's more complex than that. But um, uh, other. Comments or questions? Anybody else? Yes, Dr. Krizov. Uh, I was really struck by your use of the concept of legal relationships. Um, as a physician, now a retired physician, I've been struck that in our field, long-standing relationships uh, and really knowing the person as opposed to knowing the individual disease that they have, uh, have really withered. And I'm curious to what extent that currently exists in the legal field and what suggestions you have to actually strengthen long-term relationships in the medical field? Uh, no, that's a fantastic question. And I have, the, I have the very much the same concern in the legal field. So currently I would say that in, in most 
lines of legal practice, not all, but most lines of legal practice, the most important, um, I think, element of success is your relationship with your clients. Uh, whether we're talking about big firms, small firms, medium-sized firms, you have to have a good relationship with your clients. At, at the end of the day, um, law is still a reputation business. And it's your ability to leverage your personal net, network and what sociologists call social capital that often determines your success as an attorney. Um, so if you don't have those personal relationships, uh, you're not going to be as successful um, in, in the legal uh, profession. That being said, I think there is a concerted effort, uh, somewhat well-meaning, to kind of replace that relational model with a more kind of commoditized delivery of legal services. Um, namely, you know, why do we need, you know, then I had a host at a conference years ago on this, and there was a great debate between um, two, uh, Professor Lubon at Georgetown was the leading uh, philosopher and, and, and law professor, and, uh, and uh, Sam Eistreicher, who's a labor uh, and constitutional law professor at NYU. And anyway, the, the, quick, the quick crib notes version was, Professor Lubon gave this great story about how he went to, to talk about a will. He and his wife went to talk about a will with their lawyer. And the lawyer brought up all these things they never thought about, right? Disability and, uh, and their children's disability and things along those lines. And it was very moving to them. And it really kind of made them think about, you know, their passing in a completely different way and what they wanted to see happen afterwards. And uh, Professor Ashraker's view was like, yeah, that's all nice. I love to have new friends and them to learn all about me. But at the end of the day, I just need a document, right? And I think we're kind of moving that direction. You see that with automated deliverers, uh, providers of legal services like LegalZoom, which you may have, some of you may have heard of that advertises quite a bit. Uh, so I, I think there's kind of a push, you know, do we really need a lawyer who's got a relationship when at the end of the day, all someone wants is a legal document? And um, I think the hope is the document is if you don't have the lawyer with the relationship, it'll be cheaper, more people will get help. So they kind of focus on the bright points, but they forget about you're losing the human element. A lot of things might fall through the crack without the human element. And not to mention that lawyer can also maybe connect them to other services they need. So I, I, I fear that we're kind of moving the same way in the law. Um, do I have any suggestions how to forestall it? Um, my only hope, and I don't know if this is a hope or maybe this is dystopian, is that uh, maybe we become disillusioned with technology uh, or, or, and with some of the kind of, uh, let's, shall we say, automation that we've seen in, in general, uh, that we kind of start to question whether what we've lost, right? Um, so that's kind of my, my only hope, um, because otherwise I, I fear that uh, we've become so disconnected from each other. Uh, that it's going to be very hard for the professions to hold on to the historical uh, ties they've had with their clients and, and patients. So sorry to leave it on a kind of a sad note there, uh, well, but I'm not optimistic. Let me uh, uh, tell a little story of my own experience. I started practicing law in 1975 at a, uh, a major law firm in Washington, D.C., Arnold and Porter. And when I started practicing, uh, clients uh, would never question a bill they would never leave the firm to go somewhere else. Uh, as far as they were concerned, they were so grateful that the firm had agreed to represent them. Um, by the time I left practice nine years later, that had changed. And so for example, we began to, well, certainly they questioned their bills. If we flew, we had to give them our frequent flyer, our, the client our frequent flyer miles. And most, most pernicious, um, they would shop for lawyers. And so they would go around and sit in your conference room and you would have to tell them how you would handle their case and what you would charge them. But the trick was not to give so much away that they could then take what you had told them to a cheaper firm. And it was a complete transformation um, uh, 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 of, uh, and, and among other things, senior partners who used to be uh, uh, paid on, on a, just an equity basis for, show, you know, for showing up at the, uh, at the drinks, you know, at, at, at the cocktail hour, uh, were now being paid only on bill, based on billable hours as well as the junior associates. So I don't know, you know what's happened since 1984, but I, my sense is it certainly hasn't gotten any better in the sense of long-term, you know, that, that sense of long-term loyalty. Um, uh, 
Dr. Uh, Frisoff, do you have a question? You have a microphone. I, I think the, the other part that's fascinating to me, I remember when they started advertising lawyers with, um, with billboards. I just came back from New Mexico and about 50% of billboard ads on the highways were for accident lawyers. Um, I think that marketing, and we talked earlier in this meeting about the $30 billion spent per year in, in institutional marketing, drug company marketing. I think that marketing in a certain way makes us into consumers rather than having serious relationships. And I think that's something that we really have to address. I have a question for you, uh, uh, Mylan, and that is um, the enforcement of the uh, lawyer's fiduciary duty, the policing and the sanctioning. You mentioned that it's it's done by, you know, it's um, how, uh, so one of the questions that I have had about medicine is why haven't the uh, uh, state medical boards done a better job of uh, enforcing this duty of fidelity. And in fact, uh, some years ago, I did a study of all of the disciplinary actions brought against physicians uh, by state medical boards. And the first thing was it was almost impossible to tell whether a disciplinary action uh, was related to a breach of fiduciary duty or, or you know, professional uh, standards. It, um, the, you know, the primary reason uh, was uh, uh, sort of uh, poor medical record keeping or substance abuse. And, and I just, uh, and for those that were associated, there were just very, very, very few that I could identify that you could say the state medical boards were enforcing this duty of fidelity. Um, how come law, does law do a better job, do you think? And if so, how, how come, and if so, in 25 words or less, are there any lessons for medicine to learn from that aspect of the picture? Uh, yes. So I would say that in general, uh, disciplinary bodies, what medical, legal, what have you, they, lo they look for the low hanging fruit. So if there's a cut and dry thing that you can get someone on, you're, you're going to want to focus on that versus applying standards, which, you know, can be open to interpretation. Uh, what I think is the kind of the, the ingeniousness of the, um, of the, the approach of the, the rules that we use in the legal profession, and because we're lawyers, right, we, we take these standards and we kind of made specific rules out of the standards. Right. So um, you see fiduciary duty uh, kind of principles throughout our ethical rules, even though not specifically defined as fiduciary rules. So I mentioned the unreasonable fee thing. Right. So when you have a principle like do not charge an unreasonable fee, you're you're, a cop, you're incorporating a standard, but you're allowing something for like a comparison. Right. Well, what are other folks charging? Um, so I think that was kind of maybe the ingeniousness of our approach that maybe allows for a little bit more enforcement of these, uh, of these, uh, of these duties. Um, so I'm not sure if that is possible um, in, uh, in, the, in the medical profession, but I, I do think some specificity where you can incorporate principles as part of some of the obligations um, can be helpful and it makes it easier for regulators to actually apply uh, these principles. Uh, Professor Silvers, and let, uh, I think we, that we should take a break after this. So uh, try to make it fast. And no. I, 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 the title of the session, I like the alliteration. Uh, it works very nicely, the, the morals of the marketplace. Uh, and I get what you're driving at. But most of the time, morals are an individual thing. So part of what we're talking about with lawyers is are they being moral and following their fiduciary interests and all that. When we do the translation to the health field, I think there, there's, at least in my mind, there's a difference. Uh, when we think about quality, and we've had discussions about malpractice, for instance, on this, the illusion that it's one person that's screwed up is clearly wrong. It's a system that's screwed up. You know, multiple people had to fail for somebody to kill in most situations. So it's an organized, organizational question in healthcare. I think, more than in the legal profession that we're worried about. So the question I had was, do we need to be thinking about this, the morals of the organization rather than the morals of the individual or the morals of the marketplace? We can have a morally sound organization doing the right thing for the patient by designing that system better, by rewarding people, by not pressing too much for volume, you know, getting paid for RVUs and independent or whatever. Isn't that the place really where the translation is, is really important to think about the differences between the two? 
No, I actually, I think that's a very important uh, point. And I, I think also holds true for the legal profession. A lot of the problem is at the organizational level, right? I mean, most attorneys do work in firms of some size. Um, you often see breakdowns in firms that lead to, for example, unethical uh, conduct. Uh, but the reason I kind of like the morals of the marketplace principle, and I think is not necessarily inconsistent with what you're saying, isn't the problem that organizations think of themselves as, and let's say uh, hospitals or, or or what have you, that is to just think of themselves as any other um, kind of providers of services opening uh, operating in a marketplace, right? So yes, we offer medical services um, and other you know, other organizations offer um, different types of services. And yes, we may be a not -for -pro nominally a not-for-profit and they might have for-profit structures or what have you. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're, we're a business, we're run like a business and we operate in a marketplace, right? And if that's the ethos that an organization has, I would submit to you that's kind of, maybe that's the original sin, right? So if you operate as, as the principle, well, we're in a marketplace, we're in a position that operates in a marketplace by the morals of the marketplace. I think it's kind of hard for the individual doctor to really do much about that, right? Um, it's the organization has to think of itself as not part of a marketplace, but part of a community, right? Where um, it, is sir, it is not just servicing people, uh, but it is essentially has um, the lives of individuals in their hands who are, who are really at their mercy, right? Um, and I just think that's a very different way of thinking uh, that medical professionals and legal professionals need to have uh, and that organizations with which they're affiliated, they need to uh, have. All right, I think on that note, let's uh, thank Professor Markovich. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. On the technical side, and, and again, I think all of us wish you uh, best of health. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I really enjoyed this, and uh, I hope to see you again in future years. Thank you. Um, uh, and I'm going to be talking later today about the fiduciary duty of physicians. So if you can possibly, you know, listen in, I think it might be fun. Um, all right, let's take a break. Uh, we're running a little over, but let's take a break until uh, uh, let's take a break until just about five minutes to three, and then we'll have our uh, medical student perspective. Uh, uh, and uh, then we will have a, a couple of other things after that. Okay, thank you very much.